Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, the health medicine and bioscience edition. I have uh, Sanjeev Gupta. He's a professor of medicine uh, specializing in gastroenterology and liver diseases at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, we're going to be talking about liver and how it can regenerate. And he's going to be discussing cell-based therapies uh, involving stem cells to regenerate livers. So, Sajeev, how are you doing? Yes, I'm good, Richard. And it's a pleasure to be talking about liver regeneration with you, some of our work as well. So in, in a regular person, like what's the liver's capacity for regeneration? So liver is amongst the very few of the body's organs, at least in uh, people with a unique ability to regenerate. And that regeneration has in fact been known for very ancient uh, or long ago times. Even the Greeks knew that liver could regenerate. And there's the myth of Prometheus, for example, which uh, tells us uh, that they knew how liver regeneration could be used to punish Prometheus for having uh, done something that the gods did not like. And uh, since those days, we have now learned more that liver can regenerate both ordinarily as growth occurs and also in response to injuries or under certain induction conditions. Do so, you think uh, an IRB would approve an experiment where a vulture eats out people's livers and to see if they grow back, like Prometheus? So that is the old uh, myth. I'm, I'm just joking. Imagine, <laughs> imagine showing that to an IRB, they would like go insane. You know? I know. The new um, equivalent of that would be when we ask people to donate part of their liver to save a loved one, then that is being done routinely. And yeah, uh, that is okay. something... That would not only be IRB approved, it's a clinical uh, treatment now where uh, part of the liver is removed and put that put back into uh, children or other individuals. And we can, we'll talk about that, uh, if you like, to expand more sure, on yeah. that area. Yeah, let's start with that. So th- does the person receiving the transplant have to be immunosuppressed? Yes. So there are two or three components of it. Uh, let's begin from the beginning that... Uh, because the liver has that intrinsic ability to regenerate, it's possible to take, uh, say, half of a liver from an otherwise healthy individual and take that uh, and put that into another one where that liver would grow. So the liver that's removed grows back in the donor and it grows forwards in the one that receives it. And so that half of the liver that's transplanted or taken out becomes whole again. And uh, that can then uh, provide missing functions or it can, uh, it can save people from a failing liver. Now, this is typically done amongst family members and it's typically done if there's a good match between blood groups. So without such a match, yes, livers will get rejected much more promptly. But with that kind of a match and with the use of immunosuppressive drugs, liver uh, transplanted livers then survive and what uh, uh, what what part of the liver is transplanted i guess there's a head and then a, a, a tail part and i'm sure there's different cell types in different areas like what parts work for transplantation versus not so liver anatomically we divide up into different lobes and then segments and those segments uh, or sub components of those liver lobes are defined by the blood vessels that supply them and the drainage for of bile into bile ducts and so on, and that takes things out from them. And the reason for that division is that uh, those allow one to resect those parts without causing uh, loss of function or bleeding and damage that way. And so it's considered to be um, 
parts of liver lobes, which typically are five larger and smaller lobes in the liver, and then sub segments. So that's how we think about the liver. And uh, so those resections, let's say if half of the liver is being removed, that may be from uh, the um, anterior parts of the lobes that are closest to the abdominal wall, and half of that part will be taken out. And so that's how it is done. So you're taking out <clears throat> parts of different parts of the liver, not just chopping the thing in half and putting half in? So for putting livers into people where there would be what's called as living-related liver transplants, one would take uh, all of uh, that liver that is removed. So that should have a blood vessel to get connected to the recipient's blood vessels and drainage system, the bile ducts, that should also get connected appropriately. So and there is a drainage function that uh, gets uh, reconstituted as well because excretory functions, toxins have to come out. And so that's this solid tissue that gets transplanted. Now, in another form, uh, which is uh, being done at the moment in a research manner, tissue engineering can be done to fashion another artificial organ. And that's where we have done some work ourselves by chopping liver. Uh, it's possible to create small fragments that can then coalesce back again in an appropriate uh, scaffold. And that scaffold uh, can then form an artificial liver. And so we did an experiment where we were able to uh, take such uh, donor livers uh, in animal models and put that back uh, into not the liver, but an extra site without disturbing the liver that was damaged. And this way we could salvage acute liver failure in those animals. So that's another form of tissue engineering and artificial organ-based uh, liver regeneration. Well, what, uh, <clears throat> what happens when you implant the liver? Do you resect the liver completely in the recipients and then put in these pieces of the liver hook them up to blood supplies and they grow together. But how do you make sure that the liver grows back together the right way once it's in the recipient? All right, that's an important question uh, because uh, when we transplant livers, uh, what we call is the uh, orthotopic liver transplant, which is what we mean when livers are transplanted normally. And then um, the entire liver is taken out and that's replaced by the donor liver. Um, uh, in some circumstances, there can be variations of that theme. So if there is, um, say, a metabolic or a genetic deficiency state, which can be corrected by only a small part of the liver, uh, then it, on occasion people have tried uh, what is called as an auxiliary partial orthotopic liver transplantation, meaning part of that liver, not the entire liver, is removed and exchanged. And so that's another way of doing it. And then the third form, one could conceptually consider that uh, a, uh, an extra additional liver could be provided without uh, taking the native liver out, uh, such as, say, an acute uh, injury, such as, say, a drug dose, a poison, or something else coming in that damages the native liver partly, but that liver has the ability to regenerate then an additional support system with uh, what I mentioned in the matrix, extra tissue engineered liver can be put in there. And when that job is done, then the native liver can regenerate. So that those are the things that would be uh, the way to think about that. And there is you, much um, more. <clears throat> quick question. When you implant a liver into a recipient, if the person still maintains their native liver or part of it, is there a different interaction? versus resecting their liver totally and then giving them a transplant? Yes and no. So liver is dependent on blood supply for its optim optimal survival and uh, uh, function of various cells. And uh, liver typically gets blood supply from two sources, which again is rather unique. There are some other organs that have similar system. So part of the liver uh, is Part of the blood supply to liver comes from the hepatic artery, which is the oxygenated blood. And 70% of the blood supply to liver comes from the portal vein, though, that carries blood coming from intestines and so on and pancreas. So that has a different composition. 
if there is diversion or loss of uh, this component of blood, then a liver does not do so well. And so if another liver is transplanted and if that sorts of steals some of this uh, portal blood, blood coming with goodies contained from the intestine and pancreas, then that can be somewhat of a harmful, that can have a, a little harmful effect on the uh, native liver. So we call that as a steel phenomenon. So yes, there can be an effect this way um, of, um, you know, transplanted liver competing with the native liver. So one has to be careful, and that's part of the uh, evaluation that transplant surgeons would do to make sure something like that does not happen. But it, is the competition purely on blood supply, or is it on liver function? Is there segmentation of the function amongst the two livers? And that's also a very good question. So broadly speaking, at the higher level, one would say that, uh, yes, blood flow and blood supply and nutrients will have that effect. But as we go deeper, uh, then liver has multiple different cell types, and uh, some cells would have uh, a bigger impact of this imbalance, if I were to use that uh, phrase or word, of uh, blood flow, and other cells would resist that difference in a better way. So there's a cell type in the liver that's called endothelial cells, which are particularly sensitive to differences in oxygenated blood. And if they get disrupted or if they get damaged, though, then they do secrete other things that are necessary for uh, cells such as hepatocytes to function well or to survive. And that can then get affected as well. So, yes, many of these different cell types are highly specialized and they're interdependent in many ways. And so it uh, quickly, very quickly begins to get complex that way as well. Yeah, I just wonder what cell-to-cell communication is happening between the two livers once they're in there and, you know, what kind of effects are seen. Right. So ordinarily, if both the livers are healthy, then they would uh, just transmit the healthy to healthy signals, and that should not be deleterious. But if there is battle that begins to happen, if there is some tissue incompatibility or if an immune re- reaction begins to occur, or if during transplant uh, process there is injury in one liver versus the other, then there are soluble factors that can get secreted, which can have um, an impact both ways um, in terms of uh, damage or changes occurring throughout the body. And then uh, things quickly um, begin to get more complicated. Now, the material that is secreted from liver cells comes in many different forms. On one hand, one might say that these are proteins, something that may fall into the category of cytokines uh, and chemokines, which are chemical transmitters and signal activators, or metabolic products, uh, which may be just very small chemical molecules that still have the ability to excite different metabolic uh, changes. Or there are... um, tiny uh, micro or even smaller nanometer sized particles that can get released from inside of cells. And they contain a variety of cargos, including RNAs and proteins and other molecules that can then be secondarily picked up by other cells. And that can have a biological effect as well. So those are all very fascinating areas of active research at the moment. What um, do we do we understand why or how a liver regenerates, and why does it not regenerate in certain cases versus others? What governs that? Yes, that's another fascinating uh, question. So what we do know is that as babies are born and as they grow, uh, then liver also must grow to keep up with the metabolic needs and body size uh, requirements. And so the liver growth then in people, babies, children, is most active up to the age of 10 years or 12 years. And it begins to slow down as uh, the ratio of the liver growth versus body growth, such that in the adult liver, there is not really much cell turnover um, throughout the life unless there is some injury that comes in. Now, if there is uh, a drug toxicity, let's say if someone takes too much Tylenol, then beyond about, say, 
10 to 15 grams of Tylenol taken consecutively uh, in one go over a day, two days, three days. That can cause damage in the liver. Uh, that, in fact, uh, Tylenol overdose is one of the commonest cause for acute liver failure in the Western world and in America. And so in that setting, liver fails to regenerate. And so the question then immediately becomes, why does it not regenerate? Um, similarly, if one transplants a liver that is small for size, say the body requires a certain amount of liver and one puts in, say, 10, 20, 30% smaller liver than the body's requirements are, then that liver would fail. And that's called as small for size syndrome. Uh, and that is because the liver has stopped regenerating in that setting. Similarly, if one does a large resection of the liver, if one removes 50, 60% of the liver, then that regenerates without trouble. If one removes 80% or more of the liver, then it does not regenerate. So these are some examples where uh, liver fails to regenerate. And in part, uh, that failure resides in the way damage to DNA may occur in those residual cells. And when there's uh, a certain type of DNA damage, then cell replication gets arrested. Uh, if there's damage to mitochondria, then again, and that DNA replication may proceed, but cells can't divide. So those are some of the ways by which liver regeneration can fail. And so one could say that that is within cells and that puts a break to liver regeneration. Now, if we were to consider that just as a plant, a sapling must grow when it gets enough water, when there's enough nutrition in the earth around it, similar to that, one could conceptualize that cells in the liver must also receive appropriate signals from adjacent cells and throughout the body, and they must have the appropriate nutrition happening at the same time from outside. And when many of those things go wrong, then again, liver does not regenerate. So those are some of the ways how the liver may fail to regenerate while it does have uh, that extensive capacity to do so. So you might then want to know, can something be done to overcome these restrictions I just mentioned? So how does the liver regenerate though? Do the cells simply divide and when they didn't divide before to make more of a section of the liver? or are stem cells recruited that come to the site and are transformed and assigned the task of, all right, now you're going to become hepatocytes and they begin constructing new liver. Like, you know, what, what does it look like when it happens? Yes, uh, absolutely right. So there are these two different pathways that um, are engaged during liver regeneration. One pathway is where hepatocytes, the specialized cells in the liver, the parenchymal cells can divide uh, or become hypertrophic, meaning one cell now may acquire uh, more than uh, deployed or um, normal amounts of DNA content to become twice as much, four times as much, something that we call as a polyploid change. So through that process, when there's a simple resection done, and then liver can regenerate. A second path is where these cells, if they're damaged, and then other alternative cell populations that we might call as progenitor cells or stem cell equivalents or stem cells would come into play. And so these cells tend to come into play when there is submassive or extensive loss of hepatocytes and when they themselves are not able to go through that division or duplication process, and then stem cell compartments will get activated or if there is chronic injury and damage, as might occur with toxins or viruses or alcohol or drugs, and then again, if hepatocytes are perpetually inhibited from proliferating, that would be a particularly important uh, setting where stem cells will get recruited. Another important condition, major condition that has come along uh, into greater and greater prominence is the uh, fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic uh, liver injury due to obesity and metabolic changes or diabetes and so on, where again, because of long-term continuing injury, 
stem cells or their equivalents can uh, begin to arise. And that becomes important because some of these cells can then give rise to cancers. And so that's the bad part of uh, regeneration going awry uh, with greater cancer risk. So <clears throat> is the incidence of cancer greater when you get cells that just become hypertrophic or when they divide all of a sudden after a period of not having divided for, let's say, years? You know, are there any uh, particulars that lead more to cancer or to, you know, when a Again, when a liver regenerates, is there a healthy regeneration path versus a not as healthy one? And one's comprised more of hypertrophy versus division? Right. So what we are learning is that cancer is a condition where uh, multiple genetic abnormalities in case of liver are accumulated. And cumulatively, those are the ones that begin to alter cell cycle related genes and that leads to uh, transformation of cells and then continue and, continued and um, irreversible uh, proliferation towards malignancy. So those uh, changes seem to be particularly prominent in the setting of persistent inflammation as one component. And that inflammation can occur from a variety of different conditions. Or in addition, changes within cells where genetic lesions may appear, and that could occur uh, because of, say, uh, hepatitis viruses, hepatitis B or C uh, particularly, or genetic conditions where uh, DNA damage can occur. There are certain metabolic conditions in children and also young adults where that can occur, or um, um, additional changes uh, that may be specific to certain other disease conditions where a combination of inflammation, uh, continuing loss of hepatocytes and genetic instability may come in. Some of that could uh, occur because of exposure to carcinogens uh, uh, in the environment or coming in uh, with drug contaminations and so on. So there are multiple different ways by which uh, cancer can form. But... um... When cancer does form, I mean, what does it look like? Is there there just a a fair number of lesions? Or, again, if you look at the liver cells themselves, see that some now are dividing very quickly, you know, many times when they should not do that. Or is it that, uh, again, hypertrophy is seen in a lot of the cells? Like, you know, what are some of the characteristics when you look at tissue, cancer, cell tissue in uh, in liver? What does it look like? So in liver, cancers... uh can come from the hepatocytes, and then we call them as hepatocellular carcinomas. The example of that process would be someone who has had, say, chronic hepatitis B or chronic hepatitis C, where there may be inflammation, there may be necrosis, and if someone does an ultrasound uh, examination or another imaging test, then um, the liver might look okay, or it may look a bit scarred, And then five years down the road, some of those uh, scarred areas may turn into uh, nodules and uh, or without even nodules, there might be one or two areas that may begin to look suspicious uh, as um, uh, not showing the same healthy uh, shadows or imaging characteristics of a normal liver. And um, and these may be tiny to begin with, but then they may uh, become bigger millimeter to centimeters and bigger sized. And so there may be one, two, three or more such areas in the liver that may arise depending on the early parts of uh, that process or late parts or intermediate parts of that process. And so that is how cancers would begin to appear. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, these are not symptomatic and may just uh, show up uh, in an advanced stage. So that is how hepatocellular carcinomas tend to mostly appear. Then there can be cancers from the biliary epithelium that we call as cholangiocarcinomas, where these appear uh, to interfere with drainage of bile, or they appear from cells that are located either within those ducts or adjacent to them, And so these are the ones that may cause uh, jaundice or yellow eyes early on or may occur with uh, infections coming in uh, through um, bacteria going up um, uh, that obstructed part of the biliary system. 
there may be associated gallstones and other changes. Sometimes there are associated parasites that may cause blockage. So that may have a different manifestation uh, symptomatically and otherwise uh, lab test wise, liver tests will appear different and imaging characteristics would appear different as well. Then there can be other somewhat less common types of liver cancers uh, where there may be involvement of uh, vascular areas. Uh, they can be benign tumors of the liver as well. So there would be different uh, imaging characteristics and the way they may have their onset symptomatically or lab test wise. Uh, so there could be not one way how liver cancer tumors may show up, but a variety of different ways. Um, in terms of the regeneration capacity of the liver, are there any lessons learned there that could be applied to other tissues of the body to get them to regenerate somewhat when they don't right now? So some of those lessons, I would say, are pertinent to regeneration of pancreas. When we think about pancreas, we especially think about diabetes treatments. And with diabetes treatments, we know that there is a deficiency uh, of insulin-making cells that are called uh, beta cells and pancreatic islets. So when they are deficient, then the question uh, becomes important for understanding how they could be either replaced or stimulated to grow endogenously. And there has been uh, lots of effort going on in both of those areas. So one can transplant islets uh, isolated from um, pancreases and liver is one of the sites where those uh, islets have traditionally been transplanted and they're injected into the portal vein. And, um, and then uh, that's where they function, although there are other sites where they could be implanted as well. There has been uh, lots of uh, effort ongoing to control destruction of those islets by harnessing the immunological system, immunological forms of injuries in the pancreas, similar in some ways to what might uh, damage uh, hepatocytes, and then to think about ways uh, where genetic mechanisms could be harnessed to differentiate some of those uh, other cell types that can generate pancreatic beta cells, or to use signals from outside that may again coax them to uh, begin making insulin. And then there are connections between pancreas and liver where some subsets of liver cells can be programmed or reprogrammed to begin expressing insulin as well. And so if that can be done, and then the question comes up immediately as to what could be done to have such cells taken out, expanded, and then reintroduced and retransplanted uh, to correct diabetes. So all those areas have been under active investigation some with more success than others, but they continue to generate uh, considerable um, interest and focus uh, because of their importance for treating diabetes. Is there a way, um, you know, so liver will regenerate in vivo in the original person, and then in the recipient of a transplant, it, it will appear to regenerate. Um, <clears throat> are you able to do anything, you know, in a dish in vitro? Um, are you able to essentially culture a liver so that it grows to be more complete before transplant? So that's where stem cells and stem cell biology comes into play. Um, one could um, take um, hepatocytes and uh, isolate them uh, and culture them in a dish. But typically, these cells don't have a long lifespan on the in culture conditions. On the other hand, if they are transplanted uh, in animals or in people under appropriate conditions, then they can uh, divide and uh, divide and keep dividing without really losing their ability to divide. And so uh, some investigators have taken that approach and uh, created uh, specialized animal systems where human hepatocytes now uh, can be propagated and can be expanded. And uh, one hope in those efforts is to take such cells to create an unlimited supply for uh, cell therapy in people. Now, the other approach is to take stem cells, uh, either embryonic stem cells or uh, so-called induced pluripotent stem cells that are generated from an individual or a person, and then grown in culture dishes 
uh, and then subject it to uh, differentiation protocols, either with chemicals, uh, ideally, or with other molecules, or with transfer of genes to reprogram them into, into hepatocytes. And so we have done uh, work in that area. Many other people have done uh, work in that area. Um, all of us have had this restriction that we are not able to uh, generate um, absolutely mature types of uh, liver cells with these types of stem cells at the moment. So our understanding into what signals are needed to complete that process is incomplete. Um, but nonetheless, there is considerable hope that as we perfect these uh, mechanisms to differentiate cells, at some point, we will be able to take those cells and use them to regenerate the liver. Uh, a big advantage of taking cells from the same individual is that rejection should not be a problem. And uh, uh, that uh, as opposed to taking cells from another donor, some people um, have identified though that the total numbers of donors that may be required uh, to minimize rejection will not necessarily be too uh, onerous or too high a number. Uh, so it's possible that about 200 or 250 donor cells might well cover uh, the bulk of immunological repertoire such that uh, one would be able to transplant cells without rejection. So that is uh, quite exciting. What about um, exosomes or given off by liver cells? Is there, you know, is there any thought on um, examining those and using exosome therapy so that maybe you don't need a transplant, but you could use the exosomes from a healthy donor to uh, coach or encourage the recipient liver to start to regrow when it wouldn't otherwise? Um, that's a fascinating question you've asked. Um, so exosomes uh, are tiny little vesicles and particles that are shed by cells throughout the body, liver included. And we define exosomes as particles that are uh, below 50 to 100 nanometer in size or in diameter. Um, they are called exosomes because their equivalent uh, endosomes are tiny vesicles that reside inside the cells, whereas these are tiny vesicles that have been shed and externalized from the cells. So endosomes and these are exosomes. Their cargoes are also of... Uh, quite great interest because they have uh, dozens of micro RNAs that are regulatory uh, units that can uh, affect expression of hundreds, if uh, not more, uh, genes, every one of them. And so they can control how cellular genes might get regulated. And so if there is a certain complement of those types of things, and there are proteins and other molecules present in exosomes as well, and so if those healthy um, materials can regulate certain functions in cells where they may get uh, targeted, then things could potentially occur. Until this time, though, the bulk of uh, work in exosome biology has been to look at whether they could be of diagnostic relevance, whether they could provide information about how um, uh, some behavior of cells might be uh, predicted or uh, identified based on their content. There has been lots of interest also in whether exosomes could, through cell-cell interactions, alter biology of cancers. There has not been as much focus on their therapeutic potential uh, in terms of liver regeneration, for example, or regeneration of other tissues. Although there is information that um, exists that, um, uh, that the return of healthy exosomes in certain numbers could be beneficial for the heart, could be beneficial for the brain, could be beneficial for other organs as well. Uh, whether that by itself could regenerate the liver doing damage is a subject of ongoing investigation. In our own hands, we have done some work in this area and uh, we have an interesting series of studies that's uh, currently in review for publication where we find that healthy exosomes can indeed help uh, regenerate the uh, liver of experimental animals with injuries 
that would otherwise be fatal to them. So these are acute injuries and acute liver failure where healthy exosomes could potentially salvage those animals and rescue them. But that's an evolving area, an important one, though. Okay. And then um, have you seen any papers talking about if there's a uh, microbiome particularly attached to the liver? Or different parts of the- and that's another uh, evolving area, which is of great interest and relevance. Um, so the microbiome uh, is, uh, again, a fascinating uh, um, uh, component of the human body where there are so many changes that occur both in health and disease that uh, we do know, though, that when there is fatty liver disease, obesity-related changes then microbiome gets altered and some of the components that should be made ordinarily in the microbiome could potentially be either in excess, that may not be necessarily good, or in short supply, that may also not be necessarily good. And some of these components can in fact be taken um, as uh, potential drug candidates uh, to improve matters but that again is an area that uh, needs more more uh, study and there is i would not be surprised though uh, to uh, find that there will be a major contribution of the microbiome in their secreted materials in regulation of um, liver regeneration i'll give you one example in that area uh, related to stem cell differentiation, we were uh, looking at uh, how there might be an interaction uh, between uh, some cells and stem cells uh, that are pluripotent stem cells. And uh, suddenly we realized that the components from a given immature human cell type, fetal cell type, um, on undifferentiated stem cells was to make them liver-like. And that came about through metabolomic products. Metabolomic products are those that come up uh, in uh, uh, cells through metabolism. So they are byproducts, and those byproducts that were coming out in the that were coming out of the cells and were getting picked up by undifferentiated stem cells were having major effects and consequences on them, and they were turning them into liver-like cells. So those kinds of metabolomics products are also potentially made by microbiome. When those uh, material get materials or substances get circulated, and when they reach the liver, and then they would certainly have consequences. So we need to learn more about those areas, right? Well, so there's, always, there's a there's a ton to learn. Um, <clears throat> we're we're getting close to the end of time, but um, in particular, what what aspects of your research or what uh, part of your research do you feel like is close to coming to a, a new understanding or a breakthrough maybe in the next year or so? So two or three areas. One is uh, the ability to regenerate the liver through a drug-based approach where we are now beginning to harness the mechanisms and that occur spontaneously are going wrong after injuries is an area we are fairly excited about because uh, those are uh, practical approaches using existing drugs where we can make liver donation or liver resections safer and have um, uh, way more um, efficient and predictable regeneration after resections. The second part is with cell therapy that has been one of our major interests where when we take healthy cells, we would want, we want to rescue um, uh, people in liver failure on the one hand, and uh, make uh, liver resections and other treatments safer on the other hand. And so those are things that we are able to now accomplish by transplanting cells uh, outside of the liver for temporary support. And we are learning what kinds of signals do these cells provide that help with liver regeneration. And that's opening up for the doors for uh, drug-based approaches as well. And then uh, deficiency states where uh, if a certain genetic condition causes um, loss of liver function, then we can replace them by transplanting just those types of cells. So and those are all areas that are coming up and um, either getting uh, reinvigorated or uh, getting more robust as we have gained new insights. So we are quite excited about those areas at the moment. Excellent. 
So, Sanjeev, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and uh, ask questions? Um, not sure. Maybe the website at Einstein. Okay. So they can go to Einstein College of Medicine and look up Sanjeev Gupta and then your lab. Um, does it have a particular name? Um, they can look up my own website uh, at the Einstein College. Okay. So the description is with uh, my name as faculty members, their own webs- web homepages, web pages. That's great. Well, Sanjeev, thank you so much for coming. It's been a good call. Okay. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.